Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Closers Podcast. I'm your host, Marco Alvarado. Joining me, as always, is Quinn the Moondog Kalani. Ah, woo, 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 woo. What is up, my man? Not much. What's up, dude? Man, there's a lot that's been going on, but you're in Hawaii, and we haven't been able to talk much recently, at least on this show, because of just, like, technical issues, and then, you know, subject matter gets in the way, and finally, after two weeks... We're going to both be in on an interview of sorts. I'm pretty excited. We're going to be talking about cults, specifically for this episode, Jonestown, or better known, well, not better known, people just call them Jonestown, but they should be known as the People's Temple. That is what the cult was called. And joining us to talk about this specific cult for this week is one of my good friends, Gabriella. Hi. Hi. What's up? I'm good. I like the um, howl. Thank when you. When you introduce Quinn uh, for next time, I would like an animal noise as well. Oh, what, what, you. what would your <laughs> what would your animal what would you like your animal to be? You know, that's <laughs> you can go ahead and because Quinn that. Quinn branded himself as the Moon Dog. He's the one who who created. He kind of like set himself was, up for that. It was sort of a running joke, but uh, then it turned into a life of its own. Now, we did create some other uh, animal-esque nicknames. There's spring chickens, and there's also sun cats, and yeah. there's October There's October cows. It's, so Yeah, I don't know if you'd want to be a cow, so Gabby. But, I don't think so. You know, yeah. it's like choosing your own nickname. It just doesn't work. Let's see. Well, we'll figure it out, because you're going to be actually on two more episodes to talk about two other cults. So we have some time to come up with some sort of nickname for you. But uh, I just want to talk about you for a little bit real quick, Gabby, before we jump into Jonestown. So you currently reside in Seattle. I do. Your favorite Seattle transplant. (laughs) It's true. The only one I know, actually. (laughs) So by default, you are my favorite. Yes. (laughs) There's been some political activity happening in Seattle, just like the rest of the country. And most famously, there was a cop free zone that was established there a couple months ago um called what was it called gabby yeah so it started off as chaz which stood for capitol hill autonomous zone and they swapped it over to chop which stands for capitol hill occupied protest um so capitol hill is a district in seattle and there is a um precinct there and the cops voluntarily left and protesters came and took over I want to say it was about six to seven blocks and this was during our shelter in place so a lot of businesses were closed and businesses weren't that affected um, outside of the looting in protest but um, yeah and now the police are back yeah chop got disassembled because it turned violent there was a couple shootings um people had died and yeah yeah. okay so do you live pretty close to where this was established yeah i currently live maybe six blocks away so my area it can get rambunctious but i'm not on top of it oh okay and how long did it last there entirely Ooh, i want to say it was a couple weeks but i could be completely wrong okay the start of it it started off incredibly strong Mm -hmm. and it kind of trickled down yeah do you find it to be pretty disappointing that it ended the way it did oh this could be controversial um it's fine (laughs) trust me it's it's okay yeah Yeah, um no because it got violent um Mm, okay if it hadn't I gone violent, um, I think it would have been different. But since there were shootings from civilians, from people trying to protect the area, um, I, of course, it has to get shut down. You can't yeah. have that. Yeah, people dying and stuff. Did 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 people get die actually, or were they just injured in the shootings? Do you know by any chance? 
it definitely injured, I want to say at least one or two people had died. Um, and people had died in protests too here. Um, like there was one on a protest on the freeway and a car came and killed a couple people. Oh shit. Very unfortunate. But I think we're also seeing this everywhere else too. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just not, it's more talked about locally rather than on a big scale. That makes sense. I just know that people have been talking about the protests. I mean, there's there's different factions that have been talking about the protests in different, you know, different tones. And uh, uh, the perception I know outside of Seattle, at least, you know, from California's perspective, looking at Seattle, it's definitely like there's a lot of people pointing and being like, oh, they, you know, like Portland and Seattle, they deserve to have like federal agents going into those um into those cities because the city government can't, you know, handle it on their own, obviously. No. You live there. <laughs> you live in one of those cities. Does it look like they don't have it under control at all? Yeah, so there's a lot of local politics that's um, have gone into this, but federal agents were not needed in the slightest bit. Um, mm -hmm. It, Like I mentioned, the violence, it wasn't incredibly violent to where something like federal agents were needed right. um of course there's pushback between protesters and police as there should be mm -hmm. and people are uncomfortable which i it's great it makes it opens people's minds a bit more um yeah but no it wasn't like anything where the government or our local politicians couldn't handle and in the beginning there was support with the local politicians and then like I said, that also trickled off and people say one thing, do the other. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's good. I wanted to have somebody from that neck of the woods, as some say, to say, to say that everything is OK. You know, we don't need to send any federal, you know, goons out there or anything like that. Because I feel like yeah. I haven't heard too many people from that area necessarily having being able to have a platform, even though this isn't the most high platform. It still is something, so I just yeah, wanted to get Yeah, I that. would definitely recommend following, like, Seattle locals. I can send you some um, Instagram people to follow because there, there are leaders in Seattle that have mm -hmm. been putting these protests together. Um, anyone from the Black Lives Matter Seattle mm -hmm. chapter is a great resource. Right. So, yeah. There, yeah. It's, all, it's all local. That's why it, we don't hear much about it because I don't really know what's going on in Sacramento or the Bay right. or even L.A., yeah um, it's very local yeah every protest every city has its own little like protest ecosystem it seems yeah. it's hard to tap into those un until there's like a viral video that comes out of one city that everybody's like oh my god this is crazy and then it which becomes... is seattle or portland <laughs> yeah yeah recently yeah it's exactly that would you guys say that right now our political landscape has been divided into very 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 polarized groups would you say that you have one side that's very very right-leaning and you have a left that is very very left-leaning of course there's people in the middle but it's getting more and more polarized every month it seems it's getting the, the gap is widening would you say that would you agree I with that guy i think that um being in a city and both you and I, uh, Quinn, I miss you. you're from Hawaii, right? No. No, are you from <laughs> California? Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> I don't know, man. I know he's in Hawaii right no, now. No, I know it is, just his response has made me laugh. <laughs> uh, I think for all of us, we're all from California, and now we're kind of in various areas that yeah. we do have such a liberal leaning state and then mm -hmm. even though marco i know you're from sacramento and you probably get a different opinion on this because sacramento is so close to the state of jefferson you have a lot of no oh ideas Jesus. um yeah <laughs> yeah honestly yeah. honestly yeah. though and i think everywhere you go the close the more east you go the more right political leaning it is mm -hmm. and um i've definitely seen it very polarized especially on instagram and it's very much been a you stand with me or you stand against me and mm -hmm. we definitely saw that with um trump being elected yeah. it's you're either with me or you're against me and in certain cases i get it but also in a lot of cases it's it shouldn't be true um, right. and people are making these very bold and general statements 
which catches people's attention and Mm -hmm. which is what they're supposed to do. But once you do a little bit more research and digging and staying educated with the situation, then Mm -hmm. you might not get as polarized opinions. So I think from what we see on the media and headlines and Instagram, that's where we're getting our polarized opinions Mm. from. So, so, so it stems from the media. It stems from the information that you take in. Now, there are groups of people here that love to demonize the other side. One of the, one of the, I agree with everything you're saying, by the way, Gabby, before we jump to something else, but one of the classic ways to demonize another side is by saying like, oh, all those, you know, all those snowflakes, they have a cult-like mentality. All those, all those rednecks, they have a cult-like mentality following Trump, you know, generalizations, cult-like. Well, let me tell you, I had to research Jonestown for this episode and it's, it's, it's insane to me how because of an ecosystem, a cult-like mentality, right? We use that phrase like, oh, a cult-like mentality. We don't really know what it means. That cult-like mentality can lead to 914 people drinking Flavor-Aid. Okay, it's not Kool-Aid. Flavor-Aid and dying in a jungle in Guyana. Okay. All I'm saying, man, is that when we use that phrase, you know, cult-like mentality, we toss it around pretty generally. It has some pretty weight, pretty heavy weight to it. Actually, the weight of 914 bodies attached to it. So it's it's for me now listening to that and hearing, you know, both sides toss that around. It's like, well, I don't think people are indoctrinated into any sort of ideology to the point that they would follow somebody into the, you know, Guyanian jungle and like live there for like a year or years. And with that. I want to segue into Jonestown, if I may. Are you guys ready to take this journey with me? I am ready to drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> You're ready to drink the Kool-Aid. Are you ready to drink the Kool-Aid, Quinn? Depends on what flavor. It's lemon, I think. I think that's what they had. It was yellow. And right, it's not Kool-Aid. It's actually flavor aid. Sorry. We, we don't have that budget, okay? We can't afford the Kool-Aid. Was this the, the, Aldi's, the Aldi's brand? Yes, the Aldi's brand, yeah. Exactly. So I think it would be just to start at the inception of Jim Blockhead, Mr. Roblox himself, Jones. And I call him that because this fool's head is like a straight square, dude. You look at him, he has like the back of his head, like you're looking at him from the front. His head looks normal, but you look at him from the side, it's straight flat. You know how most people have like a curve, right? It's a normal human head. His is, it looks flat because of his hair. So it just looks straight flat. It's like a box. That's why I call him Mr. Blockhead. Okay, so when I call him that throughout this this episode, you know who I'm talking about. So I thought it'd be, it'd be just to start with his upbringing because it's very telling. Uh, I think we've all known kids that have kind of acted this way when we were growing up that are just kind of off. He, he was born in 1931. Okay. His mom and dad were not religious at all. They never took him to church. They were pretty clearly actually like atheists. They thought it was dumb to believe in that type of stuff. And they passed that on to Jim Jones. He actually bought into that. He, he, he believed that too. He believed that there was not a God, but what he did also believe in is authority. So he idolized, you know, people in positions of power. So like presidents, um, pilots, people that, you know, you, you, you would traditionally give respect to, but specifically there was one person that he very much idolized. His name is Adolf Hitler. I don't know if you've heard of him. He was very much into researching Adolf Hitler. Who's that? I know. Right. I don't, I, I, <laughs> some I, sort of relationship with Anne Frank, right? <laughs> so I, I think there's something there. I don't know. I, I couldn't get too much into it. I was too busy researching this, but, um, Apparently, this guy Adolf Hitler was the was the leader of Nazi Germany. Now, Jim Jones wasn't, you know, he didn't believe in Nazism per se, you know, actually at all, um, which we'll get to. But what he did believe in 
was the tactics that Adolf Hitler used to galvanize people around him and basically become a god in the eyes of his people. That's what he liked to research. So what this kid started doing, this kid would find dead little animals right around the neighborhood. And he didn't have any supervision because his mom was working and his dad was an alcoholic. So he could just do whatever he wanted. He would go around the neighborhood, find dead animals, and do burials for them. And he would make the neighborhood kids also partake in these funerals for these dead animals. It got to a point where he would start to kill dead animals. Or kill dead animals. <laughs> he would start to kill animals just to give them a funeral. And so kids started thinking, eh, this guy's pretty weird. So I don't know if you guys have ever known any like weird kids when you were younger. But I mean, I didn't know any kids that would do this. But I've known some kids that drifted in that weird kind of direction. He was also the type of kid that would go to school every like day in his Sunday's best. Always in a suit. Always to the nines, you know. And back then, you know, that's not cheap, you know. So, and his family wasn't rich. So he had to, he wore his clothes all the time. He wore that same outfit. Constantly. We appreciate a stylish man. Exactly. Exactly. Quinn, did you ever wear your Sunday's best to, to school? Uh, no, growing up in the South, uh, it wasn't, you know, it was just called school clothes. Now you would have, your clothes would be separated. Mm. You know, you would have clothes designated for school, you know, cause you're, but you're going to work. Yeah. You know, that right. was, uh, that, that's, that's something mentality. that's, that, that's the mentality there. You know, you have your school clothes, your school shoes, and that's what you wear to school. And then, you know, if you want to go play, well, you have a separate set of clothes for that. Right. So, okay, so, well, I'm glad it. to know that neither of you guys were the type to wear, like, really nice clothes to school and everybody else is just in, like, khakis. So. In a, in a, <laughs> in a tank top, sunglasses, and red beanie? Yeah, I'm, yeah, everyone else is in, is in their, you know, is in their beach cruiser wear, and, I, and you're the only one with, like, a nine-piece suit. Nine-piece suit? Jesus. Three-piece suit. Whatever. Okay. That's a lot of buttons. He, as he was growing up, he never really had friends. He was always on the outside. And he started to recognize that black people in America also were ostracized from the greater communal conversation, the greater, you know, country, national conversation. And he started to empathize with those people. Um, as he was growing up, he actually was taken in by a Pentecostal family. He was kind of not adopted, but he spent a lot of time around this family and they took him to you know, their church. And once he was introduced to the, to the church and he saw how the congregation would galvanize around the preacher or the pastor or the deacon, he started hopping around from church to church, all these different denominations of Christianity and started taking notes on how those different pastors or, you know, church leaders would conduct their services. So that brings us to the establishment of the first iteration of the People's Temple, which was actually called Community Unity. And it was a storefront. <laughs> what a great name, huh? It's like it has unity in two twice, right? Community. It's catchy. Unity. Very catchy. This guy was not just, you know, a cult leader. Like he he knew how to brand. You know? You don't have to go to school for marketing. Why am I in school for marketing? Like Jesus. <laughs> I ask myself that question about you um, when you oh, told wow. me what you were studying. And I'm like, why is he going to school? I know, right? <laughs> why is he doing that? Why is he wasting his time? I ask myself that every morning while I'm, eating, while I'm eating my breakfast, my avocado bagel breakfast. So he established Community Unity in 1953 in a storefront church. And he began to amass a following um, by talking to people individually and solving their problems. So for instance, there was an old lady who had no electricity at her house, an old black lady. So he literally would sit her down or sat her down and they together wrote a letter to the electrical company. And a day later she got power. So he would do very small things like that to help people. They felt loyal to him because he went out of his way to help them individually. And he started amassing a following that way. So slowly he started building rapport with people and, you know, built, built an audience. In 1955, he renamed Community Unity because it got so, it got bigger. It got big enough to, you know, they could move outside of a storefront. 
into the people's temple and they got a location in indianapolis a bigger location where he started having nightly services and jim jones did not discriminate based on race or actually based on anything um he allowed atheists to come in any sort of denomination of christianity could be welcomed in to uh the people's temple and they'd be welcomed with open arms which is pretty interesting because at the time that that kind of sparked some tensions between him and the rest of the 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 christian community in indianapolis because they weren't necessarily like as segregationist as um you know alabama but they they were you know they 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 were very much like separate but equal they're like we don't we don't like want to antagonize the black community but we don't want them around us at all and once he started bringing them into the fold um in terms of like the city then he was like i'm not the 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 community as a whole was like uh, we don't like this jim jones guy we're not really in we're not really into what he's saying may i ask um if someone were to come from another denomination were they expected to convert or were they allowed to maintain their uh, previously held faiths that's what I was actually getting to. That's a very awesome question. Thank you, Quinn. Um, so if somebody converted converted to this people's temple version of Christianity, which I'm going to outline exactly what they believed, they could keep everything that they believed in. All that you believe in when you join the people's temple is that everybody should be equal because socialism is key. Socialism is above everything. You can't have Christianity without socialism. That is what they wholehearted, wholeheartedly believed. So you can believe any book that you want. Um, you know, if you prefer the King James ver whatever book, I don't know. I'm not Christian, so I don't know these things. But you can have any sort of book, and you can have your own, you know, beliefs. But as long as you want everybody to be equal, and that's the top of your belief pyramid, then everything else can fall in line for you in the People's Temple. That is what they believe wholeheartedly. So going into socialism, there was actually three beliefs that you had to have in order to, you know, fall in line with the people's temple. So I already talked about socialism. So what I wrote down is it resembled humanitarianism or actually humanism in its understanding of the power of human beings to recreate and reshape reality for the benefit of everybody. Right. So just saying that we have the power to change our realities. That's it. That's how they viewed socialism. And then Christianity, coupled with socialism, was centered around solving the problems of the world, claimed that the real message of Christianity could be lived out through radical sharing and mutual support. And then this is the last piece, and this kind of pertains more to the later teachings of the People's Temple. But utopianism was the third facet of the people's temple's ideology and overall the overall goal of the people's temple was to establish a utopia with racial integration and social justice through socialist and christian means and so like the people who joined the people's temple real like genuinely were good people especially in the beginning like they they were young generally young uh, people of all races who, you know, during this time, the late 50s, early 60s is when the hippie movement started popping up. And so you had a lot of kids who were traveling from the East Coast, um, going out west to like San Francisco area. And all along the way, they would stop in Indianapolis and they would hear about this preacher, Jim Jones. They'd go and that he's all about integration, racial integration, and racial equality. They'd go see him and get it, get in and they would just stay in indiana there was a lot of cases of that would you so, say it's more vulnerable people that are coming into it oh definitely yeah it's definitely an aspect of cults um mm -hmm. but was he targeting more vulnerable people yes he was targeting specifically uh he he noticed i i totally forgot to leave this part out thank you gabby for bringing that up but he he saw that the black community was obviously poorer than the white community and it's easier to help uh, you know, people that don't have much than people who have already most of the power in society. So he went after specifically uh, the, the black community at first. And he actually adopted a lot of practices of um, black pastors 
and how they would talk and actually their like speech patterns like he got that deep with it so that way he could be more relatable to that community and people a lot of people claimed um that i researched that when they looked at jim jones they didn't see a white guy or a black guy or anything they didn't they didn't look at his color at all like he was just above all of that which kind of i i feel like it started that's where the whole like him becoming bigger than uh the then christianity and, and socialism came from he started separating himself putting him above everything from the very beginning but it's a, it, of course with cults it's a very slow crawl to the eventual you know point where he's like the king and they're all of his uh, like subjects right so, uh, i have a i have a question on the peripheral marco yeah. mm-hmm. um do you know because I don't. At which point did the did the Greek word utopia, meaning uh, no place, nowhere, uh-huh. be- become synonymous with a with a land of idealism? So the term was actually coined by Sir Thomas More for his 1516 book Utopia, describing a fictional island society in the South Atlantic Ocean off the coast of South America. The opposite of a utopia is a dystopia, which dominates. So I don't know where you. Getting... Well, the Greek, the Greek origin of the word, if you look up the Greek origin of the word utopia, uh-huh. it uh-huh. actually translates to nowhere. I, I know that. I know that for a fact, but I don't, I don't know where it yeah, got lost I, in translation. I have no idea. That is interesting, though, that it once meant the opposite. But yeah, in terms you might of wanna, like... you might want to double check that. I believe I'm right that utopia is Greek for nowhere. Yeah. D- yeah. You're right. Yeah. Um, it could be because a utopia is a part of a, an imagined community, so it's just not possible to have. So that's where the um, nowhere can stem from, is that we cannot have a utopia. Yeah, the author might have been using, yeah, like Gabby said, might have been using that word specifically as a device to kind of signify that a utopia isn't possible. It is it's... literally nowhere. So it's interesting that, you know, we have so many societies within a greater society that strives for a place that is non-existent. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the that's the core. That's what he's not talking about a utopia yet. You know, like like a lot of, uh, you know, churches talk about, you know, heaven and a mm. paradise, like go to paradise. Eventually, we'll get to the part where he's like, oh, we found paradise. It's in Guyana. You know, yeah, and that's well. It's that's just kinda... it's interesting, you know, because the end game of the search of the utopia ultimately leads to nowhere. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually I'm reading a little bit more about this, and so utopia is spelled with a U, and then in Greek, what you were saying, the translation is um, O U, um, utopias, and so that means no place or nowhere, and then there's also etopias with an E U, which is a good place. Mm. so it's almost like a play on words interesting so that so, so, so it has an inverse it has an inverse uh a word that goes along with it mm-hmm. i just sent you the um the article that i just read see this um, guy thomas moore man he knew how to play with words if that's one thing he knew he knew how to make interesting new words <laughs> let me tell you we love puns here. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask um, if you had like three points yeah. um, that they followed. What would you want to call that? Um, they never wrote down exactly what they believed. That was I, I got that um, off of the San Diego State University website. San Diego State, for some reason, did a lot of research on Jim Jones. I, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. But yeah, so one of the themes was um, you mentioned radical sharing. And mm-hmm. um, is that going back to resources? Yes. Yeah. So with radical sharing specifically, the everything, um, this doesn't come till like a couple years later, um, where he really is hardcore about, uh, the congregation giving Jim Jones, everything, giving them, giving him and the church or the temple, their their houses, their money, um, everything, their cars, uh, you know, even, even, it'll get to the point where they're giving even their significant others and children to him in, in, in all the ways that you are, that you are thinking that that means that that is what it means. And um, yeah, I get, it gets pretty bad and sharing in individualism from the beginning is already, you know, the devil 
because he's taking socialism very like obviously very seriously but he he puts the community above the individual but eventually the community is replaced with jim jones and he is the community you don't have a community without me and that is where he gets people to do literally almost anything yeah uh, which is like a theme we're gonna see here over the next couple episodes because Mm -hmm. these leaders they're providing a resource for some for people that they won't have without them or manipulated into believing so exactly exactly and it's it yeah it's crazy to see the descent the spiral down this crazy rabbit hole that leads to guyana apparently we know where it's on the can can we make sure we're pronouncing this right it's guyana Guy, okay. Yeah, it is. It's Guyana. <laughs> I, I thought it was some... Guyana, but it's no, it's not. It's Guyana. Guyana. Okay. Yes. Yes. So <laughs> the last thing we need is to <laughs> mispronounce. I know. Yeah. No, it's it's not. Okay. So so let's see. So after the group, the People's Temple began gaining more and more traction in Indianapolis. Jim Jones began reading Esquire magazine and <laughs> I'm just kidding he didn't he, he always he always he always read he always read Esquire magazine he's a classy guy he needs, and uh, he needs to know what's going on yeah he, he needs to know right so so basically what happens is Jim Jones is reading an Esquire magazine and they have an article that say like top 10 best places to go or top eight best places to go um in the world to escape a nuclear fallout. On that list was Ukiah, California, and Guyana. That's a literal article that uh, you can look up. It really is a thing. And guys, my grandma's from Ukiah. Like she really? lives in Ukiah. Oh, dude, she might have she might have met Jim Jones. <laughs> I'll have to ask her what's her relationship with Jim Jones. <laughs> you might. You might have to because so they don't go there straight away. A lot of people, you know, get confused. Jim Jones actually went to Guyana and Brazil before they ever left to to Ukiah. So it was at this point that he's like, okay, I'm getting heat in Indianapolis for, you know, uh, creating this congregation that's integrated. And I he's a paranoid guy, just naturally. And around this time, he started taking amphetamines, which is why he started having to wear sunglasses, because his eyes became red as my hat, like literally that red. Um, but anyways, that's not until a little later when his eyes got that bad, but he started becoming really paranoid, um, about a nuclear war and, you know, a fallout and stuff like that. So he wanted to go to a place where, you know, once the end of days come, the congregation will be the people that repopulate the earth. And this is, this is still late seventies or no, 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 we're, we're, we're in 19, way before that we're in 1961 right now. So in 1961, we're at the start of the cold war. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I would say so. So, so was yeah. would you say his nuclear war fears were founded or uh I mean considering considering the political climate of the Cold War. I mean, I don't I'm not I don't know much about the Cold War and like the climate of the time specifically, but I know a lot of people were scared around that time and he used that fear to his advantage, but also because he was also scared too. It wasn't yeah. like he was totally cool he was also kind of freaking out so he took down two places and he was like you know what let's go to let's go to ghana so he packed up his family and moved out to guyana and he tried to build a congregation out there and he went out there in 1962 he stayed out there for two years and look people tell you if you're from outside of california don't you know, like everyone has the everyone has the dream to become a, a movie star, right? Not everybody, but there's some people around the world that want to go and become a movie star. People want to come to Hollywood. That's the place you go to become famous, right? That's what everyone thinks. And you fail because most people fail at that. Well, Guyana is like that, but for missionaries. Like there's a ton of people that like from every denomination, even like there were some, I don't know if they use the term missionaries, but there were some people who are Muslim who also were trying to spread that religion in Brazil and Ghana at the time. So there was a lot of different uh, faiths in that area. And also he didn't speak Portuguese. So he wasn't very, he wasn't successful, successful at all in cultivating another congregation because he was hoping because there was so much poverty in that area at the time, um, 
he was going to use that to his advantage and he was going to be able to, you know, make an even bigger congregation there, but it just didn't work out. Just to clarify, Guyana is on the east coast of uh, South America, like north of Brazil. Yeah, it's Guyana. Okay. Yeah. Guyana. Okay. Yeah, okay. Guyana. And that's so why, that's why they speak Portuguese. Guys. Yeah, it's northeast corner of it, um, right next to Venezuela. And gotcha. which is okay. that's going to be really interesting later on. But it was a total failure. He wasn't able to build a congregation there at all. And but he was also a huge narcissist. Go figure. No way. Who would have believed? Who would have thought? What right? a surprise. I know, yeah. A, a cult leader, a narcissist? No way. But he he never wanted to admit when he was wrong or when he lost. He never wanted to fail. That was like his biggest fear is failing. So he stayed in Guyana even a year after he realized it was just not gonna happen. They, eventually his family moved to Sao Paulo and then JFK got assassinated. And once JFK got assassinated, he used that as um, an excuse to go back to the States. He was like, okay, my people need me because like this crazy time's happening in America. I need to be with my people. So he went back. So the cult just, so the people's temple just ran on while he was gone for the two years. Everything was fine. Nothing shocking happened. They were just happy and mm, well no? that's what he thought oh that's what he thought but then and then he happened. returns he returns and he realized that the the temple is split up into like different subgroups because he left he he didn't just leave like one person in charge of it i couldn't find any information on who he left the people's temple in like in charge with but it was a group of people and each person almost like took up a different part of Jim Jones. Like there was somebody who was super, super into Christianity. Another person just totally into socialism. Another person who, you know, was just into the racial integration part of it. And they, the people that like believed in socialism more for part that were in the congregation left and followed that person. And then another, like it, they totally split up. And You're there saying was, the absence, the absence of Jim Jones, the absence of their leader beget tribalism within the people. Exactly. Temple. Exactly. Okay. Hmm. Exactly. So with that, with his congregation already split up, nobody really caring about Jim Jones coming back. And also because of the um, the racial tensions at the time still ramping up in that area. And uh, he packed up his remaining followers and was like, all right, I guess we're going to go to my second choice, Ukiah, California. We're going there. So he moved everybody over there into a compound in Ukiah. Okay, so just to sum it up, you're using a lot of words here. <laughs> he was from, he went to um, Guyana first and then came back after JFK mm -hmm. and then found out his, so the um, People's Temple was almost falling apart without yeah. his leadership and it created some subgroups. So he lost some followers yeah. and then he decided to make a new, not make a new, but just head head west, west. Mm -hmm. yeah. with his followers and then also gain new ones yes so right. that's that's actually what i was gonna i wrote down so on the way to california he they they bought like five greyhound buses and fit everybody in there they bought the greyhound buses they bought like a greyhound business buses. expense yes <laughs> they bought greyhound buses and drove all the way across country who drove you need a special license for that <laughs> I dude, I, <laughs> apparently you can sway bus drivers with socialism. Who would have thought? Who would have thought you could sway bus drivers with just socialistic ideas? <laughs> Public city bus drivers, yeah, <laughs> they, they they need to easily be swayed by socialism. Hey, I I know, yeah. So, uh, on their way across country, they stopped in different towns too, and Jim Jones did guest sermons at different churches along the way. And so they were able to convert. I, I, I see that term is, is interesting too, because they didn't even necessarily convert them. They integrated them into their group. That's a better yeah. way to say it. They so along the way, they were all inclusive. Yes. And like how one person described it is like Jim Jones came into town. He had, a, you know, buses full of people and it was like a party started in their, in their town. Like people started like dancing. There's like music. Like it's a it's a it's a fun environment. They get caught up in the party and like oh yeah let's go on these buses and like they go on the buses and the party's happening and then all of a sudden they drive off and they, everyone's like wait what the fuck wait no what why are we leaving oh shit okay I'm in it 
And like that, they would literally like just do that from city to city all the way to Ukiah. And they kidnapped with... people. No, because they wanted to go. They would. But then they're driving off. Yeah. And I yeah, guess this goes off. back to free will and free choice. Exactly. They yeah. could turn around, but like, they're already on a bus. There were people who were like, "Hey, can you let me off?" And they would let those people off. But generally, okay. like once they got on the bus, okay. and people were like, "People were like, hey, like." I know, like, it's weird. You might not have been expecting this, but, like, this is what we want. Like, you would be, you would fit perfectly in. And then at that point, the followers would do their thing and, like, try to integrate that person. So no kidnapping was involved. Not that, not that I could find. Maybe, (laughs) maybe people were kidnapped. I don't So at the moment, they're, they're a nonviolent organization. They are, they are 100% nonviolent at this moment. Actually, for the majority of the time, they're, they're, they're pretty nonviolent. Um, but that does obviously, of course, change. But um, so they go to Ukiah. And at this point, Jim Jones starts spreading his tentacles into San Francisco politics and California politics. And he starts using his giant base of people that he has um, to like sway elections and get more clout within the government. Sounds like Amazon. Basically. He was a young Bezos, young Bezos. He, yeah. Around this time is actually when he started wearing the sunglasses all the time around this time. And it's I, sunny in California. Hey, man. True. Sunny California. He's the, he's the Jack Nicholson of cult leaders. Yes. I want to just go back real quick and just clarify why I spent a lot of time talking about his first trip to Guyana. That's the turning point for him to really like that's that's when him failing to establish that in Guyana kind of made him go crazy like that's when he wanted to like 100 percent double down on everything he was doing in indianapolis and he wasn't gonna allow anybody and especially mm. when he came back to indiana and saw all that he was like no i'm not gonna allow anybody to take me down or take my people away from me that's when that whole mentality started going uh, yeah started i imagine setting it. i imagine you know coming back to guyana and seeing how how splintered everyone was without you know in his absence yes i imagine exactly. he shouldered uh he shouldered the blame for that did he not oh definitely yeah he did and of course it wasn't just like he was able to just pick up and leave indianapolis um mm-hmm. he at this point is when he kind of started becoming kind of a dick um even more than he already just is naturally and so he, when people weren't on board with moving to California. He he would generally do three things. He would start with the fear. Oh, there's there's going to be a nuclear war and you are going to die in a nuclear fallout if you don't come with me. And then if they're like, "No, I feel safe here." Then he's like, "Well, California has a lot of opportunity. We're going to be close to San Francisco." Like there it's you know, it's a good economy. is not that close to San Francisco. Well, to to people on the East Coast, it is. And <laughs> And they have buses, too, so they would go to the city pretty often for, like, recruitments and stuff. But anyways, and then the third thing he would use if opportunity and fear wouldn't work is guilt. He's like, hey, remember when I helped you um, turn the lights on back at your place? Yeah, you owe me. You need to come with me because you owe me. And they would he would guilt trip people into going. So at that point, that's when the manipulation definitely, definitely sunk in a lot. And it just continued when they got to Ukiah because at this point is when they really became a com- like they got into a compound before they were living all in their own little houses and stuff. But this is when the mentality of a cult really set in because people would go work right wherever they would go for outside their jobs, the cult outside of the cult. They would go work. Their paychecks would be given directly to Jim Jones or like Jim Jones's inner circle. And then they would get an allowance out of what they made. They would get like pennies out of that. The rest would go to the church. And then on top of that, they would have to work like 80 hour weeks within the, the, um, the compound doing like random shit. Like, like of course, like cleaning dishes and like straightening up, but also like they would have like a bunch of people just like digging holes for no reason off to one side. Like they would find ways to exhaust. He would find ways to exhaust his people, um, which I think both of you could attest. Like if you're, if you have a if you have a group of people that are exhausted, they're not going to think clearly. They're not going to really, you know, be able to. I was just going to say it's almost like he is giving them tasks to make it seem like they have a purpose within exactly. the community. 
and also to make them delusional. Exactly. And when everybody questioned, hey, like, I worked my ass off at work and then I have to come back and dig holes for the rest of the night. Like, I want to go to sleep. He'd be like, that's very bourgeois of you. And then he would give them spankings. They're not playful, okay? These spankings that he would give people are with, like, belts. And it would be up to, like, 200 lashings. Um, like, there was at least a couple accounts where people got beat that bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so, a physical abuse started around this time. Um, of course, around that time, there's a lot of, you know, hippies. And a lot of them um, came into the group as well because in San Francisco, every weekend... Uh, they would get him and his congregation would get bussed into San Francisco and they would like try to recruit people in to the people's temple. Kind of like how you see, um, what are they called? Those people with like the signs that just sit in random places. Uh, Jehovah's There's Witnesses. There's a lot of those. Hey, don't, we're not talking shit about Jehovah Witnesses. No, I'm not talking no, shit. No, no. I'm, I'm not talking shit about anybody. I'm just saying that's a practice that Jim Jones and his people used. Very a lot of cults did this. They went out for recruiting and either like put up signs or just hand out flyers. Yeah. Um, Scientology too. They would sit and do like free diagnostics with their mm-hmm. um, diagnetics. Yeah, exactly. So that's what they would do on the weekends. And of course, everyone is really happy. They would sing songs on the street. Um, a lot of people who were, you know, uh, addicted to drugs or alcohol, um, a lot of you know, young LGBT folk who were ousted from their Midwest homes, their Midwest parents' homes would, you know, wind up in the temple because they had nowhere else to go. And Jim Jones is like, I, I will welcome you in with open arms. And they were, you know, given a place to stay. A lot of people, it was their last line uh, before mm-hmm. homelessness. So he very much preyed on those people. Um, and the thing too, it wasn't just him. Like he had an inner circle that would do everything and anything he said. And th- that inner circle was definitely established in Indiana with some of his most loyal people who knew that he was all bullshit when it came to being a prophet, which I'm going to get into right now. So how did Jim Jones come off as a prophet and people swore up and down that he performed miracles right in front of their eyes? Well, because he's a con man. He's a con man. And he knew that there were people within the church who were atheists who didn't care about all this Christianity stuff and they just wanted socialism. That's all they wanted. So he would take those people aside and be like, hey, if you help me, if you help me fool these Christian people, we can further socialism because we need people. Numbers equals wins. So that's what they did. There was there was a video, really hilarious video of this lady in a cast in a wheelchair and She's in the congregation and Jim Jones points her out and it's like, you're in a wheelchair. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, you're going to walk today. And she's like, no, I'm not. I can't. My leg's broken. She's like, He's like, no, you're going to walk today. Take the cast off. And like magically the cast just comes off of her and she's like, her leg is there. And he's like, t- he's like doing the whole hand thing. He's like giving her power and shit. Speaking in tongues. Talk ab- hmm? Speaking in tongues. <laughs> Are you going to talk about the um, cancer Yes, Chicken I'm going to talk breast. about the cancer. Okay. I got that out of your essay, which I thank you for allowing me to uh, peruse. It was very helpful. Um, so with this lady in the wheelchair, he was like, giving her power or whatever with his hand. I don't fucking know. From the pulpit. Okay. He wasn't like up close. And he was like, walk, take a step. She's like, I can't, I can't take a step. She like takes a really like, like, you know, unsure step. And she like almost falls down and like people help her up. And he's like, take another step. And she like takes another step. And like over the course of like three minutes, she's like magically running. She's literally running around this. Like this Gump. Yeah. Like Forrest Gump, just straight booking it across. <laughs> like this old lady is just running around this, this church. People are going crazy, losing their minds. People are throwing their hats up in the air. Like people are going insane for this. And uh, yeah, that was all bullshit. I don't know if, if you could tell that was actually not real. Uh, <laughs> the paper mache cast gave it away but. yeah yeah I think that's the first sign um, also well, like what Gabby was referring to there is a uh, a classic thing he would do is like hey you have cancer like he would just point to a random person in the crowd <laughs> just like you have cancer you don't even know and they're like what <laughs> me yeah you you have cancer hey 
you other person from the other side of the room help that person from the other side of the room who has cancer pass it. So what they what he'd make them do is go to the bathroom. He'd go make them go to the bathroom. They'd, you know, pass the cancer and they'd bring Digestively? the apparently no one else was allowed in the bathroom except for that person uh, who was passing it and the helper who was designated by Jim Jones. They would gotcha. come out of the bathroom with this like bloody excrement and like a paper towel. Give it to Jim Jones, and he's like, he passed the cancer, and everyone's like, yeah! You it know? was a chicken breast. Yeah, it was chicken breast. <laughs> well, well, in fairness, was it free-range chicken? Because if it wasn't, you know, <laughs> cancer is cancer. Is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know about the, the quality of life that the chicken had, um, but there were many chickens who were harmed in this practice, which mm. I do not condone. I wonder if they uh, ate it afterwards, because it's a community, so maybe, or they were all vegetarians, you know? Maybe. <laughs> Either that, or they gave it to the pet chimpanzee that was the, the pet chimpanzee that was fa- that was uh, actually the mascot of um, the People's Temple for a long time. I'm not sure exactly how long they had him, but in Ukiah, there was a pet store that uh, Jim Jones purchased this random chimpanzee that was just for sale there. He purchased it, and it his name was Mister Mister. Mr. Muggs. It was named Mr. Muggs. His name was Mr. Muggs, and he was a chimpanzee. And he a actually, name yeah, it was a, yeah. They probably made him wear like a bow tie and everything too. Poor thing. A bowler um, hat. Yeah, with a cigar and <laughs> 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 poor thing, man. But yeah, no, it 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 tragically uh, passed away in Jonestown. It it survived up until the actual massacre and it's actually counted it as to one Guyana of... with it? Yes. Yeah. Do they also buy the planes? Because I don't think you're allowed to bring a chimpanzee on a plane. I'll get to the planes. All right. All right. Because there's, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there. Um, so that's how he would kind of stage his miraculous actions, right? That's a, that's a way he did it. There's, there's a lot of other things that he would do over the course of the people's simple existence to make people, think that he was actually a prophet um but those are like the most famous things that i could find um i don't want to go on for too long so that's why i'm kind of like shorting it up i think the rise is a lot more interesting than the fall Mm -hmm. and that's why people already know about what kind of happened um like towards the end end. of the people's temple but i thought the rise is interesting so that's why i spent more time on that um so one of his most famous sayings that he would constantly say and I'm going to get into I'm going to dig a little deep into this aspect because I find it really, really interesting. And I kind of touched on it when it came to like passing the chicken guts or the cancer. Uh, but he would often say is, if you see me as a friend, I'll be your friend. If you see me as a father, I'll be your father. If you see me as your savior, I'll be your savior. If you see me as your God, I'll even be your God. So the, around this time, he would start he started to say this a lot. And what he was doing by saying this is obviously I will be whatever you want me to be. Mm -hmm. And because he had people who just were following him for the socialistic ideology or just following him because of the Christianity or just the racial, um, the, the anti-racism angle or, or any other reason he knew he had like, kind of like a, um, a ragtag group of people, even though it was close to a thousand people at this point, but it's still, he wasn't just under one ideology. There was a lot of different things he was pulling from. A lot of people he was pulling from. So he was like, I will be anything you want. And like like I said earlier, where he would tell like the people who didn't believe in God at all, and he'd pull them aside and be like, hey, so these people, I don't fucking like these people. Like, I like you guys. You guys are my people. And so you guys have to help me convince them that I'm God so we can like rise up. Like he would pull the socialists aside, and then he would also pull the Christians aside and be like, see, they're non-believers, okay? So like you, th- th- you have to try to convince them that I am God because that's, you know, so he would, he would do a lot of interplay within the group and he would make them fight uh, and and create some animosity within the group just so that way he could come in and solve it and stop it and look like an authority figure to both sides. uh, That phrase that you quoted earlier that he Mm -hmm. said, you know, that's, that's pretty ingenious because that takes, that puts the self-fulfilling element of uh, of their organization it takes it away from jim jones and it puts it on the people yeah and around this time is when he not only was getting more traction politically in san francisco and california but this is around the time when he started looking again at guyana because 
he sent people there around this time. So this is around 1974, I believe. Around 1974 is when he started sending people to Guyana to build People's Temple and the compound that is famously known today. Um, he sent them out there and they started building it. And there was a lot of issues with it that I don't think I'll have time to get into. But, um, I mean, the terrain there is horrible for, for farming. It's nothing but just mud. And it's mud on top of, like, stone dirt. Like, hard, hard dirt. And that's, like, like the second river layer. Like, bedrock. Is it, yeah. is, it, is it, like, the beginning of the Amazon Basin? I believe so. So it's very swampy and stuff? Very, Before very, it opens very. up into, like, the river? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's north, so it's still, like... Yeah, it's still pretty... It's kind of like... It's like Florida. Yeah. Yeah, kind of close to that type of area, but way more trees, I'd say, because gotcha. it was a straight up jungle um, yeah. where they had it. So he sent his best workers out there to build this. Now, why did Guyana allow this? You may ask. I wasn't, but it's OK. Oh, OK. Well, you know what? I will tell you anyways. They allowed Americans to build a compound where they did strategically because Venezuela was not friends with Guyana. Venezuela was actually thinking about invading Guyana at the time because Guyana, if I understand correctly, was a fairly, uh, you know, poor country. And a lot of the people identified as Venezuelans who were in Guyana. So they wanted to kind of annex Guyana. Is Venezuela at this time, um, you know, this kind of like socialist kind of, uh, I don't want to say beacon, but the socialist marker then that we mm -hmm. identify it as today? I think the beginnings of it are around that time. Um, I okay. will look, I will see the timeline of that real quick. I'll look it up if you want to keep talking. Guyana, the government, allowed for Jim Jones to build this compound strategically close to the Venezuelan border. So that way... Venezuela would be like, fuck, they have Americans there. Like, we're not going to we're not going to attack Guyana and accidentally kill Americans, because at that point, we're we're going to get invaded by America. And they've already, you know, fucked up like Nicaragua and Honduras with all these coups. Like, we don't need any more. Little did they know, you know, it's, it's going to happen to them regardless. But um, so that that was like the big reason why Guyana was like, yes, build it. I don't we, we need protection. You guys, your lives itself will protect us. So. Off they went to build this this temple. Jim Jones at this time was still in uh, SF or in Northern California, Ukiah area. They actually franchised three other temples or actually two other temples. They had uh, the Ukiah place and then they had one in San Francisco and then they had one in L.A. So they went across the whole state with this. So he became a really big uh, just figure in California uh, during the late 60s and spe especially the early 70s, he began to establish himself so big, in fact, and his following became so recognized that the governor, Jerry Jones, is that his name? Yeah, Jerry, Jerry Brown. Jones. <laughs> Jerry Jones, the Cowboys. Jerry Jones, <laughs> Jerry Jones the Jer <laughs> intercept the two. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. J Jerry Brown actually like praised him publicly in one of his speeches, I believe. I couldn't find the specific speech, but it's... I. I'm pretty sure he sung his praises in a public speech. Quick sidebar, uh, Venezuela, technically the socialist government of Venezuela started in 1999 when Hugo Chavez uh, became president. Technically, that's when it started, but as is the case with many countries in South America, there was, you know, turmoil, revolution, yeah. foreign okay. influence, so. Okay, thank you for that. He became a favorite of George Masconi's. Uh, he became a pretty integral part of his entourage. And George Moscone, for those of you who don't know, was the ex-mayor of San Francisco during this time. And he was a Democrat. And he was in a tight race against a Republican candidate. I do not have the name off the top of my head. I did not write it down. I should have. I'm sorry. But he, he was in a tight race with this, with this Republican. And he needed Jim Jones' support. So Jim Jones sent his entire congregation in the san francisco chapter and in the ukiah chapter out on a bus ride to vote for this guy so they all voted for this man george Moscone, and of course this you know sparked a lot of media attention to jim jones people started looking into 
Jim Jones, and they actually started finding a lot of people, defectors from the People's Temple, who, you know, didn't like anything that was going on in uh, the People's Temple. You know, they cited not just the, the beatings that would happen, but also the boxing matches. So what he would do, Jim Jones and his, his entourage would do is with defectors or people who were thinking of leaving, he would force them to fight people like twice their size that they would specifically lose uh, against and would do this. Sometimes people would have to fight like five people in a night and it would be like an old lady getting beaten up by like five dudes or like a child getting beaten up by like, by like a big, you know, dude with like who, who, who is mentally challenged. You know, it was barbaric. It was turning barbaric. And that's what they cited. Jesus. And that's, yeah, that's what they used a lot in this article um, that they published in the San Francisco Chronicle. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, the San Francisco Chronicle. Luckily for Jim Jones. So I kind of skipped over some time because things were just kind of building up still. Like they was still just building up the church in 1975 and 6. Jim Jones got a copy of that article that was damning him. That exposed the temple for everything. In 1976, he got that before it got published, and he just told everybody overnight. He was like, we're leaving. We're going. And they're like, where? We're going to the promised land. It's ready. It's like, wait, what? It's an actual place? Like, it's ready? Yes, it's ready. We're going tomorrow morning. I have the planes ready and everything. So he packed up most of the people and flew out to Guyana. Of course, the plane, he only had two planes that were given to, um, to them by the Guyanese government. So they wanted Americans there so badly, they donated planes. They allowed, they, their own government planes flew them yeah. out there. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the Guyanese allowed them to come in with their own planes. They flew out and they had to make multiple trips back and forth, but they got everybody out there. Now, imagine if you're a person who built this place. It's like Quinn. It's like when our old boss would be gone for a week in Mexico, right? Everything would work perfectly. Everything's just fine. We're chilling. Like, everyone's just happy going to work. We're chilling. And then he comes back. And he's just, Herschel, uh, what are you doing? Huh? Why are you doing things this way? Hmm? Why are you doing things that way? Why didn't you tell this person that? Like, he started micromanaging everything. People's lives became even more miserable. And also, he was able to decompress out of his Jim Jones pastor sermon character. You know, at the end of the day, he was able to go home and just, like, not be that guy for at least hour an hour or two you know over here in guyana he had to be on all the time constantly and that's is this is where his alcoholism and his drug use of amphetamines came even became a bigger bigger issue and you could hear it in some of the recordings he started sounding like the droopy dog he started talking like so that he's too he's too deep now he can't he there's no way out yeah there's no way out and what's crazy and i think this ties to waco actually a little bit why they reacted, why the government reacted like they did with Waco and also to um, Ruby Ridge uh, prior to Waco. Ra Waco, Jesus Christ. They, the government didn't really care that everyone was going to Guyana. Like, they got a bunch of complaints, but the government was like, Wait, if they want to go, they can go. Like, it's not our issue. Like, they, they can do what they want. Like, I'm sorry that you missed your, your daughter, but um, sorry, mom. You, 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 there's nothing we can do. Kick like, rocks. She, yeah. yeah, she's going. She's gone. So sorry. So families of the people that were in the People's Temple were complaining to the similar to Scientology. They yes. complained to the government. They were okay. complaining a lot, um, specifically in San Mateo County. Um, a ton of people in San Mateo County. Um, home of Tom Brady. Home of Tom Brady. Yeah, home of true. Gabriella Elwell. <laughs> and Gabriella Elwell. It's true. Who needs Tom Brady when you got Gabriella Elwell? But um, people from san mateo county were complaining so much that actually the congressman of the time leo ryan made arrangements to go to check out the people's temple compound in guyana in jonestown what, what exactly were they complaining about like what, what were the what was the nature of their complaints was it was it oddities was it you know they were fearing it... they were fearing for their their relative lives because of the because of the article that came out Oh, okay. That, I got you. I yeah. got you. So it wasn't just like adjacent community members who, you know, are just like paranoid about these people living in their community. They're just kind of weird. And so yeah, they're just no. like forcing complaints. These are actually uh, people with blood ties to this yes. thing. Got you. Yeah. Family meaning like blood family, like yeah, relatives that never wanted them to be in this organization to begin with. 
that right, now right, fear right. for their relatives' lives. That's gotcha. that's who's complaining. And um, so Leo Ryan, actually, he's a very hands-on type of congressman from what I could gather. He actually spent um, a week as an inmate in uh, Folsom State Prison just so that way he could, you know, see um, what could be fixed in that specific prison. So Damn. he was a very hand, yeah, he was a very hands-on type of uh, congressman. A rarity. Yeah, and although he was gonna go to Guyana or Guy, Guyana, sorry, although he's gonna go there and you know, he was saying, "Oh, I'm gonna help your relatives," he really didn't care because they went under their own free will from all for as as he thought, and he was like, "I can get a vacation out of this. Like, I'm gonna go to South America. We're gonna chill with these people in Jonestown. It's gonna be chill. I'm gonna bring like the news crew. They'll like film some stuff, and like it'll be fine. I'll be back in a week." Well, he didn't come back in a week. Okay. Um, little did he know that Jim Jones, when he got there, started instituting this policy of white knights. And he called these knights white knights because this is when they would practice, like he would gather everybody and he would say, all right, the U S government is at our doorstep. They're right over there across the trees, across the tree line. Like they're right there. This is it. We're dying tonight. Like drink this. And everybody was forced to drink this concoction of, you know, flavor aid. They knew that it was poison, but they were forced to drink it because they're half, you know, they, they swore allegiance to Jim Jones and then he would watch everybody drink it. And then he'd say, okay, it was just a test. And these were called white knights, not black knights because most of his congregation was black and he didn't want uh, any sort of bad stigma on that. So it was white knights. And so when Leo Ryan came, Oddly, he was very, very quiet about everything. He didn't say anything regarding there being another white knight or anything. He allowed them to come in. And also, I got to say, people think that Leo Ryan was the only person or like the, Leo, Ryan and, Leo Ryan and his group of politicians and like media were the only people that ever went into Jonestown before this. They were there a whole year before Leo Ryan came. Um, so they were there from 77 till, you know, November uh, 19 or November 18th, 1978. So they were there just for, like for a year. I don't know what day they arrived because a lot of people, you know, came in waves. But uh, it was 77 to 78. And um, actually, the Russian government came earlier in the year to, to see the compound because they were all trying to get annexation from or, or uh, protection from the Russian government. And they literally just came to like laugh at Jonestown. They like came and they're like, oh, you guys are more socialist than us. Ha, and they just left like they were like, OK, we don't care. That, that literally happened. And um, so with that out of the way, this isn't out of the ordinary for people to come and visit Jonestown. So they hosted um, Leo Ryan and his entourage the night of, let's see, night, November 17th, 1978. He flew in and they threw a big party for him. And they were singing. They actually had a band that was uh, playing there. Very good band. They actually have a they recorded an album. Um, they recorded an album in the, the Museum of Death before it was the Museum of Death. Uh, yeah, which fun fact. But anyways, uh, <laughs> they were playing music and it was like a party. And Leo Ryan famously gets on the mic at the end of this party. And it's like, I have not seen anything today that has led me to believe that you all are in danger. I am thoroughly impressed. And the roar of the crowd, even just listening to this, like over just the internet through YouTube, you know, just li hearing that was ridiculous. Like it was almost one of the loudest things I've ever heard. And I was listening to it on like, like low volume. So if I, I know that if I would have turned it up, my, my ears would have been ringing a lot. So these people were just like super loud. And what's interesting is looking back after everything that happened is that you could hear the relief in that scream, that yell. Like people were like, okay, we're not dying tonight. Like we're safe because he believes that everything's fine here. That wow. you, hear, you hear that kind of primal, like happiness come out. It's, it's scary. It was a scream of relief. Yes. Wow. And shortly after that, one of the uh, members, I forgot their name, but they were actually interviewed in the PBS documentary, which I pulled a lot of this information from. Um, of Jonestown, but he walked up to the congressman or actually no, to a news crew member who he thought was a congressman 
and he like shakenly handed this guy a note. And he was so scared that he dropped the note and picked it back up. And a little kid next to him was like, he passed the note. He passed the note. So like the little kid, even like little kids were indoctrinated in this thing. Like they were told like to tell, to make it, you know, be alarm systems basically for the entire group. And so at that point, shit hit the fan. And like other people came forward and were like, hey, can you please help us get out of here? Like, we don't want to be here. I know you think that it looks nice, but this is all just a show. Like, we want to go. And so, like, Leo Ryan's like, God damn it, man. I was trying to just chill. Like, I'm not trying to, I'm not being here. I don't want to be here to save people. It's my vacation, yo. Exactly. Bummer, right? He's like, God, oh, you're such a buzzkill, man. Like, all you guys wanting to go home. Like, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> so, so he's like begrudgingly, like, okay, all right, we'll see if we have enough room to take you guys out you know with us like i don't we don't have that much room on the planes we have two planes just like you did coming in so like we don't have a lot of room and so they go to sleep that day and jim jones knows about this um but he's like okay my people are conditioned enough to like snuff out any defectors they're not going to allow anybody to leave like i trust my people enough for that but then in the night like 17 people ran out and left the compound into the jungle never to be seen again I think some of them got back to the States, but I'm not sure. I, I'm, I didn't follow their story, their journey much, but I just know they escaped the compound. And then the morning, it was fucking chaos. Everybody, like, there was people packing their things. Other people were, like, trying to stop those people who were packing. There was, like, children crying. Like, Jim Jones wakes up at noon, and he's like, what the fuck is going on? Who wakes and, up at noon? <sighs> You know, I do, I do some, apparently Quinn does too. (laughs) Never mind. Never mind. (laughs) Never mind. (laughs) But yeah, so he wakes up at noon and he walks outside and everything's just going crazy. And he's like, okay, this is bad. Like, this is, this is it. He knew today's the day. And he, he goes up to Leo Ryan, who's getting um, his things together and is having breakfast in like the common plaza area. And he goes up and he's, and he starts talking to him saying like, I don't know why these people are acting crazy. You know, they, it's just, you know, we, ha- you know, some of us are kind of hungry. We're, we're running low on food and, you know, trying to make excuses. And Leo's just like, Hey man, I get it. Like, it's fine. No worries. Like if people want to leave, like people can leave though. Right. And he's like, yeah, yeah, of course people can leave. Yeah. Like it's fine. And he's like, okay, well, can you say that to like the news crew? They wanted to interview you. He's like, yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I can yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say that. To the, to the news crew so he has an interview with the news crew on november 18th 1978 he has an interview that you can watch on youtube where he's just like shaking and he's just like yeah they're like so people can leave if they want to he's like yeah i've never said they couldn't leave why, why, why would i allow that like we're happy though no one wants to leave and then he hands them they hand him a note the note that the guy gave the news crew the night before it's like well we have a note saying that like the conditions are terrible here and people want to leave he's like oh well, why are you got why are you gonna listen to these liars they're liars like i can't stop people from lying of course there's gonna be people who are gonna lie but we're doing fine it, you know like i can't i don't control everybody i can't control the people like trying to save face and eventually leo ryan is like gathering his things and is about to leave and Jerry, Jerry Jones, Jim Jones, got all these J names, dude. Blockhead, okay? Blockhead. Blockhead. <laughs> Blockhead goes up to one of his closest, like, enforcers. And it's like, hey, I need you to kill Leo Ryan. Here's a knife. He gives him a knife. And he sends him out. And this guy's, like, shaking. And it's just chaos everywhere. Because it's, like, 900, over 900 people just, like, trying to do a bunch of shit. I don't know. Some people leaving, some people going. He goes up to Leo Ryan and it's just like, it's time for you to die, motherfucker. And he just stands there with his knife on his throat. And Leo Ryan's just like frozen. (laughs) Is this quoted? You will die today, motherfucker? Yeah, that's quoted. (laughs) That's quoted. He says that. And he freezes. And then two other members of the cult grab the, the assailant and throw him down and like restrain him. So like, People are even, like, trying to protect the congressman at this point. So 
And um, in the process of getting thrown down, the assailant cut his hand and blood splattered on Leo Ryan. That's why you see blood on him. A lot of people think he got cut by that guy, but he didn't. It was the assailant's blood on Leo Ryan. So after that, they're like, fuck this. Let's get out of here. So everyone is leaving. And there's like even more pandemonium because like kids are like crying because their their mom, like some people's moms left them there because they just wanted to go. go they just needed to go home. So like some people left their kids um, and their family at Jonestown who wanted to stay. They even left them. So it was a really, really emotional packed day. And as they were leaving, so they filled up like a dump truck. That's what they called it. But it just looked like a pickup truck full of people. And they were driving to the airport or to the airstrip. And all of a sudden, this other car drives up full of like armed guards. But not in like armor, actually. I shouldn't say armed guards. I don't know. They had guns. And they started unloading on Leo Ryan and his entourage and like the other people who were trying to leave the defectors. And off in the distance were Guyanese military who were watching this happen. And they were like, oh, it's those crazy people out in Jonestown. Should we step in? No, we're not going to step in. Because if we kill Americans at any rate, we're going we're gonna to get fucked up. So we, ha- we can't do anything. So Leo Ryan and four others passed away in that. Uh, drive-by shooting there was other um congressmen there are congress men and women there too oh, that were yeah you're right there was a second congresswoman who it's jackie uh, spears right yes you know? yeah it was I, jackie spears yeah yeah, yeah 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 she got injured i believe mm-hmm. and she, she actually yeah. talked in the documentary and she's like yeah i got shot um and they actually went around and they shot everybody like point blank range who was laying on the ground so everybody got injured but it, miraculously some people survived it and talked about it in that documentary, which I highly recommend you to check out. It's called Jonestown um, by PBS. And so at that point, at while that onslaught is happening on the airstrip, you pivot over to Jonestown and Jim Jones has everybody in the, in the center area of Jonestown. And he's like, it's time. It's the final white night. And everybody was just like, what? It's like, pfft, like it's not real. Like you've, you've, you've cried wolf so many times. And like, he's like, no, it's really happening. It's really happening. Get everything together. So he sent his his circle to get the cyanide, which the most fucked up part for me is the cost of the cyanide. It cost him eight dollars, eight dollars plus the flavor aid. I don't know how much that costed, but I know the cyanide itself cost eight dollars for him to kill over nine hundred people. Did they have to like import the cyanide or, you know, because cyanide, you can naturally harvest it from certain plants. Yeah, no, they they bought it in the States. Oh, and then you. they brought it with them. He he had the cyanide for years prior. Okay. Just I was stored. wondering yeah. if, well, if, if, like, the reason why it was so cheap was, you know, maybe it was purchased outside of America. But mm, I see. Yeah, no. You also have to take into account how much there was and also inflation. So $8 then is not $8 today. I agree. But also, you have to have a lot of cyanide to um, kill over 900 people. Yeah. It, it it sounds well okay it actually doesn't sound worse than it is it still is bad regardless but yeah you have to take into account things but at the end of the day 900 people died and it's really at the end of the out. day we don't need math <laughs> and we don't need to sit here and determine the cost yeah of the, the proportion what? how much cyanide for one person you know like I, it goes back to the grocery store Marco. <laughs> i know it does i know it's fine um so they first started with the children and they had syringes full of this stuff uh the flavor aid mixed with cyanide and they didn't inject the kids they didn't stab them they just you know shot it in their mouths and they drank it and he he you could hear there's there's archives of this where you hear jim jones talking while these people are dying there's i don't think there's video just audio but you hear like children crying and stuff and he's just like it'll be okay we're going to we're going to a better place we're just passing over to another area. We're not, you know, another plane. We're not actually dying. This isn't, this is, this is the death of our physical form, but we're not actually dying, you know? A lot of people claim, even like the survivors claim that he, he, uh, even didn't believe in God, even up to the end. Like he didn't care. He was just saying this stuff just to save face. And he, um, he started with the children. And then eventually once they were all gone, the adults went up and took cups and started drinking. And the people who didn't want to take it, 
were attacked and they were those were stabbed those were those people were injected with needles that had the cyanide inf infused flavor aid injected into their arms some people were able to escape and there are survivors from Jonestown who do talk uh, about it and are there's one actually the head, who's the head of the Jonestown Institute who I got some information from and um, Jim Jones himself though was uh, shot in the head by one of his closest uh, confidants I guess uh, this this younger girl I forgot her name um, but she was the last one to die she shot herself she was tasked for cleaning up and like basically making sure everybody else was dead before she took her own life 900 including the people who died on the airstrip 914 people died because of this man and his teachings and everything that he did thus concludes the horrific tragedy of Jonestown and I will say that after this um, happened, the awareness of cult of cults and for cults across the United States just like spread like wildfire. And it ramped up to what I would say is Waco. And that's where I will leave this portion because we are going to talk about Waco next um, on our next episode. So I hope you guys are interested in that. But that is kind of the ascent and downfall of Jonestown and Blockhead. Sir Blockhead himself. Sir Blockhead. So after hearing, after hearing you talk about it from start to finish, it's actually really interesting because I started thinking, because we all say, well, we don't all say, but the term drink the Kool-Aid, mm -hmm. it's meant more as a you are following everyone else. So that's how you're drinking the Kool-Aid is you're with a group of people and you're following them yes. um, in a more civilized situation. Um, yeah. But hearing you talk about this, it sound, people were trying to escape. People did not want to drink the Kool-Aid. Not everybody. So it's interesting how it's formulated into what we, how we use the t phrase today. Yeah. Exactly. And what's really interesting is that phrase is exactly is like the, the lasting memory of Jonestown. And, he and always, it wasn't even Kool-Aid. It wasn't even Kool-Aid. And also he always wanted to be revered as like this great godly man. He wanted to he wanted to have that place in the culture's heart of, oh, Jim Jones, whenever you bring up his name, just, oh, he was such a great guy. Oh, he was such a great, you know, he wanted that. And what, what did he have been? And what did he get? Ah, oh, it seems like those liberals over there are drinking the Kool-Aid. You know, like, that's what he gets. That's his legacy. Just a joke. Like, like a phrase that people, you know, use very, very just nonchalantly. I don't think his legacy is a joke, though. It's, more, it's a serious, like, not, over 900 people died. Oh, so no. So that's what he's known for, not, I yeah. I, yeah. No, I agree. But I think the, the thing that culturally we tend to associate with him is that yes. phrase. You're saying the joke has diminished the uh, the actual consequences of something. To a degree, because he, I just think it's it's interesting and kind of funny, not in a funny way, not funny in the sense like 914 people died and that's funny, but it's funny how he, his end goal was so narcissistic. He was such a narcissistic person and he always wanted to look good in front of people. He wanted everyone to love him and he ended up, everybody that did love him, he killed them. And then the rest of the world thinks of him as not just a psychopath and not just a manipulator, but also, um, you know, giving fodder to that kind of tongue in cheek, like sort of mentality. And that's what I'm kind of referring to. Yeah. And there's so much information out there on Jonestown, which is great. Cause like you mentioned, it is, it did spark, um, how to point out a cult. Um, yeah. and luckily there are, was like videos at that time too. So I know that it's really hard to stomach watching these documentaries and hearing these stories. Um, even just yeah. you talking about it, my stomach's upside oh, down. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm right there with you. I hate it. It makes me so upset. Like it made me so mad yesterday. Like just hearing like the kids and all this stuff. Like, like there's people who consciously made the choice. To, yes, like I'm gonna drink this, but even they are victims because like they believed that this man is saving them this man is their salvation and therefore and through manipulation through these brute tactics he was able to convince all those people and by force or by mental manipulation 
to kill themselves. And that's that's just it's just so fucked up. It's just it's ridiculous that that even that is even possible. And it just shows like the state of America at that time, because there were so many things that were happening that, you know, a cult in, you know, Northern California was the last thing on the public's mind. You know, there was like, okay, we have a lot of other things to worry about. You know, Martin Luther King got, you know, shot like, like, you know, that was in the sixties, but still like there was so many other public or, um, you know, well, you got social uh, things happening. the, uh, the Iran hostage situation, right? Jimmy Carter's president in 78, huh? Yeah. Yep. So there, I mean, there are some big things going on around this time. Yeah. It's interesting seeing how, cause like you guys just mentioned that there are like bigger things happening at that time frame and just how people take advantage of these vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable situations. And I think we're still seeing that today. I think so um, too. Especially with our, the civil unrest that's occurring. You just yeah. see these awful people taking advantage and they get overlooked because it's, there's something bigger going on. Exactly. And it's just, it's sickening that that even happened, but at the same time, you know, the only thing we can do is be more vigilant and fair when it comes to you know these sorts of things because like it goes back to also the 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 conversation that i had with with brianna last week where we talked about grooming like grooming happens all the time it's not just you know like a it's not just a, a harmful inherently a harmful thing like you get groomed by your parents to fit into society you get groomed by your teachers in order to fit into the classroom setting you know it's almost so so commonplace that it doesn't even merit its own terminology maybe possibly i would argue it does but that's for another time um with but anyways like it's so hard to see when when people get indoctrinated or like you know uh set in their ways ideologically speaking it's really tough to to to, to see that you know and it's just awareness really is the, is the theme that i get or the lesson is just you got to be more aware and you got to be more careful um yeah overall sorry to bum everybody out jesus christ everyone's just like oh fuck <laughs> this is so <laughs> sad nothing ends well with cults that's the thing too you know but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways let me to, ask you this yeah do you feel like the term um do you feel like the term cult has been reduced to a sort of demonization um sort of term do you think in its true, uh, in its true definition, that it actually applies to damn near everything else. What do you think, Gabby? Oh yeah. Well, no, I was just thinking about that too, because like, what determines a cult versus not a cult? Because um, you can claim anything as a cult, and um, right. I mean, like a political party. Yeah, that can easily almost, almost blind faith is a, is in itself. That's, like the the prerequisite that's the key ingredient yeah so yeah. i think what determines a cult outside of a community is like we we're talking about this just a narcissistic figure that is manipulating individuals and believing that the they cannot function without that community yeah exactly <clears throat> well that's yeah. almost every organization is it not well I think that gets into a very broad and big that's conversation. That's yeah, that's, weeds, that's huh? the, that's, that's, that's the cuts right there. You get that's, that's what you're asking. That's what you're asking, but <laughs> yeah. take um, like yoga, a, a good example of people can call it a cult because you have Bikram, but there's so much more to it. And there's not one specific person or one specific group that people are looking up to, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that doesn't make sense. I guess my question is, is every religion in itself a cult? At the very every... basic definition of what a cult is, does every religion fall underneath that umbrella? Every religion, at least at some point, or at, I, you know, I can't make a definitive claim, but I would think, I would, in my mind, I would assume, safely, I think, it's safe to assume that at some point every religion has at least as started or has had some sort of leanings towards cultistic practices at some point in their existence. But I can't, obviously I can't def definitively like point to every single instance, but right. Yeah. Well, I mean the cult itself is, is, is a very hard term to, to define. 
cults have existed since paganism, the cult of Dionysus. Yeah. If if you know if if yeah if, for Gre- yeah if with the Greek. two if the two key ingredients of a cult is is you know one a strong figurehead mm-hmm. and two uh you know blind faith of its supporters. I think yeah. one could make the argument that cults are essential to to civilization. That civilization is in itself a cult. Uh-huh. I think well that's the thing though is you could argue possibly the for the possibility of of civilization being comprised of cults. Right. But a collection of cults. I wouldn't say civilization in itself is a cult. I think um in the thing too you have to remember is with cults you are away from society. You are you are a hundred percent stripped of your identity, and you are just part of this greater collective. And in you know a country, could you, you call the the greater or smaller collective itself a society? What do you are what? you not are you not abandoning one society for another? It's like its own ecosystem. Mm-hmm. I think is what. Yeah, we're getting it's at a, here. It, it's an ecosystem that. I think specifically benefits inherently and in every single way benefits that one person at the top and they will disguise all of these, you know, terrible things as I'm helping you. I'm doing you a favor. I'm doing all these things. I don't think that's, that's that practice. That's very defining of a cult in my opinion. And Mm. you see that especially in, in Jonestown, like that's like Jim Jones is like, Right. Calling to be clear, card. I'm not. I'm not taking a side. I'm just posing questions. Yeah, no, they're I, pressing I, I, questions, and um, I think they're great. Uh, so I actually searched the definition of a cult, and mm-hmm. the first thing that comes up uh, off of Google is um, a religion or religious sect generally considered to be extremist or false. And then you go on to the um, Merriam-Webster, and it's a religious, a religion regarded as unorthodox. So mm, well, both I mean, of those kind of have yeah that, that I mean, that's that's very complicated because who determines mm-hmm. what's unorthodox if not the yeah. majority mm-hmm. exactly and yeah because like I don't know for me like I look at certain religious groups that most don't consider to be a cult and I would be like oh they kind of look like a cult but then you know others are like no why would that be no like they're not a cult they don't you know. So it, I think it's very subjective, but there are objective instances of yeah. where it's like, yes, this is a cult. And that's what I was kind of getting at in the intro for uh, Jonestown when I was ramping up to talk about it, is that like we throw that term around so much and we, we try to lump people into these groups and, like you said, Quinn, demonize each other when that word cult has so much weight behind it and um, there's so many things that are attached to that term when Um, when when did it take on a negative connotation i think because it it wasn't it wasn't always negatively associated i don't know i i haven't studied cults in general i just have studied jonestown so i would i would think i would think around this time because this is such a you know this is like the one of the first moment moments where like there was this cult that did this crazy thing and you have to also think manson and the Charles, the Manson family was, yeah. I believe, earlier than this. Um, so, uh, see, yeah, a decade earlier. Yeah. So, Late 60s. yeah. So, like, the Manson family already happened. And so people already had this idea of, you know, cult activity. But the thing, too, is I think when it comes to the Manson murders and the Manson family, people are like, oh, those are just hippies. And, like, that look, that aesthetic that they portrayed, that's what we have to look out for more so than the the practices and no one thought jim jones this guy with like aviator sunglasses and slick right. back hair and like a really nice suit and a lot of money would be leading something very similar to the manson family like i don't think i guess saw that. i guess i come away just questioning you know much in a way that every revolutionary is considered a terrorist by the country they're they're you know trying to trying to break away from mm-hmm to a so I, so I wonder, you know, how how the majority uh, dictates uh, the perception of these sort of things. Mm. Yeah, you know? I that's that's but, a great question. I, I don't know how really how to answer that. I think right, it's just uh, you know, 
my tr my train of thoughts everywhere but i'm thinking like you know the colonials were once considered terrorist by you know england well i think there's a there's difference between well, orthodox and cult. orthodox christianity is considered unorthodox because of western christianity mm -hmm. right so i'm so, so i'm just you know I, i'm i'm snowballing to what effect the majority has on mm -hmm. uh labeling uh minorities yeah. Yeah. which which we know is which we know is you know obvious but i think i think just cults and the cults that we're talking about specifically are like very very small very like sub 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 subgroups of the greater society whereas what you're talking about these ideas these religions have have been elevated to a point in our society where they comprise millions of people and at right. that point they're integral to our culture and integral to our country it's in right. at that point those groups there's not one specific figure being like hey you got to get your spankings tonight like there's not like none of that's happening you know like at least at least don't okay. read the old testament <laughs> yeah okay i i i i know there's exceptions to that but the but the greater amount of people most people would would, would look down on those types of practices yeah you know? i understand I, I'm just curious, you know, to what point does the minority evolve into into something that is accepted? So I'm curious, you know, if Jonestown had never ventured, you know, into the dark oh. arts, yeah, yeah, would yeah. they, you know, if they had kept growing in population, uh, you know, would they well, have just been accepted as a as a separate branch of Christianity? Well, Scientology is a great example of this, then. If yes. that's what you're going for, even though Scientology is actually one of the only religions that are re recognized as a religion that is not a form of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where a lot of people, uh, these leaders, they want more star power and that's how they get it spread across through a bunch of different people because they're able to get into the media and promote it that way. Exactly. While we see Jim Jones took it from a different ap approach Mm -hmm. he was definitely leaning that way he wanted to run he was going like he had aspirations to one day like run for governor of california and like like become a political like figure. person a huge figure across the country right. and become a global name like he wanted that um but his narcissism and his fear of people leaving him uh got in the way of that and... do you think every religious leader has to have some sort of degree of narcissism yeah a degree i think every i think every person on earth every has a degree of, of narcissism right but uh yeah. but leaders themselves have to do you think they have to do you think a prerequisite for for leadership is to have a higher degree of narcissism perhaps than your average joe or what Jill? do you think what do you think gabby do you have a response to that i don't know i mean i'm trying to think of people that like, like who's who seeks to be president if not to be president well okay so i think politics is different because you can take um because yeah politics you have those we've seen it very just narcissistic figures um well, I, and then you have with the pope. i would i would i would say same thing with the pope maybe i don't know mm. makes sense um and you but you do have people trying to come in and change that and want to bring a greater good for the community and i think martin luther king is probably a great example of that he didn't want maybe he didn't want this to be a public figure, but he just had so much goodness to say yeah. that he somehow just kind of got put into that leadership role. Yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah, there are, there are instances of people not necessarily wanting to become leaders who wind up becoming leaders of causes uh, because they are chosen by the people, not necessarily appointed by themselves. Although that's becoming more and more rare. That does happen. I mean, recently, nothing. We've seen nobody but people like what you're talking about, you know, in in the government, and I think that's where a lot of modern problems stem from. At least the problems we're facing right now, I think. I think we can agree. On, I think all three of us can agree on that for sure. Mm. I just wonder, you know, to what to what level in any sort of position of power is there an intrinsic selfishness uh, to 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 acquire that from the lowest level to the top level from your police officer is there a selfishness you know i want to help people because it makes me feel better 
Well, there's plenty of studies and books out there that proves that this is true, that that's why we do community service. Like, even though it is something greater than us and it's much appreciated, but there's always going to be selfishness involved in it because it makes us feel good. Exactly. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's why I do the podcast. That's why I did it because I needed something to do to keep me occupied and to make me feel like I'm being productive and feel good. And like, as much as people listen to it, and I love the people who listen to it. Thank you. Also, thank you to the one person who keeps listening to us all the way from Manhattan, New York. You're awesome. Yes. <laughs> You're awesome. Shout out to Manhattan. Yeah, shout out. I, I've never been there, but I, I really want to now. Um, oh, you should bring this person on. <laughs> dude, I would love to. Let, DM the Closers Podcast Instagram account at the Closers Podcast, and I will get back to you. But, like, even please though be I... It, please be, like, a like a like a child that would be fucking hilarious i would die like just, just like, like a 12 year old like oh this sounds good i'd be like okay i need to i need to uh I, yeah if i have them on i have to have them like sign a waiver have their parents sign like hey you need to release allow your kid to like come on the show if you're comfortable no with that. no i think it'd be best just to avoid that all the time i agree with i you, agree Quinn. i agree i'm just saying like if, no. if, that, if it came to that if you're over the age of 18 and you've been listening to this podcast, please DM Marco. <laughs> yes, please. And if you're from Manhattan, yeah, that'd be awesome. But yeah, I mean, I think I think that's uh, an example of like where selfish, you know, there's always selfish feelings in everything. And um, mm. I mean, but, but selfishness inherently isn't negative. That's another thing that people have to remember. Like just because you are so just because you do have you do selfish things, it doesn't mean that you are a bad person doesn't mean right you know too much of one thing is a bad thing that's what i talk about a lot on closing out the week that's what my theme of the week is always it's always a yin and yang it's like well yeah balance it's all balance you know it always comes down to balance it seems well does it do you guys have anything else to say before we pivot and go to weekly recommendations uh no marco just uh thank you for enlightening us uh enlightening me on on uh, jonestown i appreciate it of course it's my pleasure yeah. sir Thanks, Marco. This has yeah. been great. I'm yeah. stoked to well work with you too for the yeah. next uh, couple times. It'll be fun. Thank you, Gabby, for coming on. Can't wait to hear more from you as well. Can't, what What's the cult that you are going to be investigating? I don't think we I talked think, about uh, it. I think Quinn pronounces it the best. <laughs> <laughs> Quinn, how do you pronounce the cult that she's... I, <laughs> I have no idea what to say. <laughs> on the surface it looks like numbers to me it looks like roman numerals <laughs> on that note no. <laughs> we'll and be doing a bit of digging on uh nixium nixium awesome can't wait for that it's gonna be a fun ride it's actually the most recent of the three cults that we are going to be deep diving on so that'll be cool mm. that'll be the last episode of the series quinn will come at us next time with waco waco texas waco texas them texas thumbs yeah. i could yeah i could use a texas thumb <laughs> right now we're gonna go and do some weekly wrecks so here they are All right, guys, hope you enjoyed that um, pretty long part, that long segment with Gabriella Elwell. Uh, she'll be on, like we said, for two more episodes in the future. We're going to talk about Waco, Waco, and also Nivum, Nivixium, or whatever it's called. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> yep. We're going to talk about that cult, uh, the most recent one, with Gabby. She's going to break down that one. Quinn's going to break down Waco. But right now, we have some recommendations for you. We're going to keep it very short. One recommendation each for this week, since this is a pretty long episode. Don't want to keep you for too long. So, Quinn, what is your recommendation for this week? As you hinted at uh, seconds ago, um, yeah, on, uh, on our next episode featuring Gabby, we will I will be uh, discussing uh, Waco. Uh, the Waco tragedy. I don't see. There's not. There's no other way you could identify it as anything but a tragedy. I firmly believe there's America pre-Waco and there's an America post-Waco. My recommendation is a six-part series that came out on the Paramount Network two years ago that you can currently find on Netflix. 
that draws upon two books, Stalling Time by Gary Noser, who was the lead FBI negotiator in the Waco case for the first half of it, and um, a autobiography by one of the survivors, one of the nine survivors of the Waco tragedy, David Thibodeau, uh, whose uh, name of the book I can't remember. I think it's called Surviving Waco. Uh-huh. Um, the series itself stars uh, the incomparable Michael Shannon, who I believe is one of the great actors of our time. Uh, as Gary Noser, Taylor Kitsch from uh, Friday Night Lights, the series, plays David Koresh, the leader of uh, the uh, Branch Davidians. Um, it's John Leguizamo. John Leguizamo is also in this, and he steals the fucking show. John Leguizamo is legit. But basically what it does, this uh, the six-part series, is it chronicles the Waco siege. And what's brilliant about it is that it is – it's un, it's as, it, it's unbiased. It does – I will say that it does temper um, some of the things around David Koresh, but I, I appreciate – how it took from two sources, two primary sources on opposing sides uh -huh. and consolidated that to form one coherent story. Interesting. That's something that you don't often get. That's something that was uh, completely in void of when Waco happened. Yeah. All that was propagated was the uh, federal narrative. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And what this, uh, what this uh, series really does is illuminate and most importantly humanize um the 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 poor souls that uh mm. that died uh that died at waco man you know we have a tendency and in this you'll hear this a lot in these episodes that we're talking about when it comes to like cults and stuff we have a tendency to uh to ostracize demonize and dehumanize um people who sort of uh we sort of fall into these sort of things. Mm. And uh, I think this this show does a really fantastic job of, of restoring humanity to these people. And uh, I, that's, a, that's a noble thing. It's a noble thing. It gives agency to people who were, in my opinion, murdered. And um, I highly recommend it. It's, it's self-titled Waco on Netflix uh, for you guys to enjoy right now. Thanks, Quinn. Yeah, I'm definitely going to have to check that out before your episode comes out. It is not going to be uh, the Waco episode. Our Waco episode is not going to be out until Wednesday the 26th. Uh, in between that, we are going to interview Paper Airplanes, uh, a local Sacramento pop punk band. Um, they're pretty close friends of mine in the music scene, so I'm really excited to talk to them. But after that episode, then we're going to get to Waco. Um so, you have time to consume that six-part series. You have about two weeks. So, for my recommendation, it kind of it is very much in the lane of cults and uh, has to do with with cult activity. And it is a documentary called Holy Hell. It is on Netflix. It is directed by Will Allen. Will Allen was the writer and director. Will Allen, who is the writer and director of the movie. He also was a member of the cult that they explore and kind of uh, kind of uh, expose in this documentary. It centers around the cult called the Buddha Field. And this, uh, this one man, uh, his name, he, he changes his name constantly, constantly. But he, he, he's called Michael at one point, And Michelle. then he... In, oh Michelle, sorry Michelle at one point, and then this other guy. What's what are some other names, Quinn? That, that... <laughs> he, go, he he goes by Andreas at the oh, end. <laughs> Andreas and Reishi at the very yeah. end. At the very end, he calls himself Reishi. He changes his name constantly, and it's a cult that was established in like the eighties, and it still exists today. It is it 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 they they moved from Hawaii or no from Hollywood to Austin, Texas, and then they went out to Hawaii. And um, stones a stone's throw away from where I am right now. Honestly, yeah, God, not far. Same island. Yeah, and so they, it just talks about how that cult became um, established, how it started out not as a cult, um, and then it very much started 
a pattern that we've seen pretty often, and you can draw some parallels between Jonestown, uh, the People's Temple, and the Buddha Field. Obviously, the Buddha Field didn't get to the point as Jonestown did, but just the moving around, the movement um, from, you know, point A, you know, first uh, you have Hollywood, then Austin, now Hawaii, you know, with Jonestown. You have Indianapolis, Ukiah, you know, uh, Guyana. So you have a lot of movement, and that's that's one really interesting takeaway I took away from it. Uh, but there are some, you know, comedic moments. There are some light moments within this documentary that you you're just looking at the TV. You're asking yourself, "What the fuck am I? What am I looking at?" And and you have some, you know, very sad moments, some very very touching emotional parts as well. Um, there's a little bit of everything in it, and you come away with some sympathy, but also a lesson in the resiliency of the human spirit. And I think that's the most, uh, the biggest lesson you could take away from this documentary, Holy Hell, which is on Netflix and it is directed, like like I said, by Will Allen. So that is my recommendation. Quinn, what did you think of the documentary? Uh, I thought it was amazing. Um, it had a, uh, I, one thing it had in its favor, it used so much of the amateur footage that Will Allen captured. Yeah man that took you right into buddha field and it was some real spectacular footage too um man it was really awesome it was really cool uh there there, there (laughs) are parts that are that are so fantastic and i don't mean that in a positive sense but in like a in like a otherworldly sense like you wouldn't expect half of this shit that happens that it's it's hard almost not to laugh yeah it's just like oh my god yeah. And then, you know, it draws you back in and you're just like, oh, Jesus. And you feel like an asshole for laughing. But exactly. And I don't know yeah. about you, but but I found myself I found myself like getting entrenched within the Buddha field myself while watching like the first part mm. of it. And then all of a sudden, like I snap out of it at a certain part. I don't want to give anything away, but you you snap out of it at a certain point. You're like, wait, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. And, the high ends, the high ends. Yeah. And you're yeah. just like, I can't believe this is happening. Wait a second. Like this isn't normal. Like none of this shit is normal. And then, and then, it, it does a great job of immersing you, just like you said. Uh, mm. It immerses the viewer, and then it takes you, snaps you out of it at a certain point, and you're just like, I can't believe that I even kind of fell into yeah. it, just even for this like short much, thirty much, minutes. Much like a trance. Yes. Much like a trance, and then you know you snap back to reality, and you realize how harsh that reality is. Exactly. And you know what a great name, Buddha Field. What a dope fucking name. The only name that could be better is Gouda Field. Gouda? Bacon oh, yeah. and Gouda. A great Starbucks yeah. sandwich. I'll My tell favorite. you what, I'll join, I'd join that cult tomorrow. <laughs> the Gouda Field. Is that a cheesy joke? Hello. Oh, my. Okay. Hey. Okay. Hey, I hey, think, hey, all right. Okay. Hey. I think we have, I think this episode's run its course. I think it's I think it's time for us to bid you all an adieu. Please follow us on Instagram at the Closers Podcast, on Facebook at Closers Podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are the Closers Podcast. Share these episodes with your friends, your family, and your significant others. Make sure uh, make sure if you guys go to YouTube, you have the option to uh, to switch the notification setting to where you can uh, see all of our content, uh, including closing out the week hosted by marco hang 10 hosted by me and of course uh you know our 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 flagship the closers podcast yep every wednesday exactly you can get all three of those shows by just subscribing to our youtube channel or our spotify or our itunes you can have your choice we also are on every other podcasting service uh streaming service so you have your choice you have your pick of the litter whatever you want And like I said, please share these episodes. Helps out a lot. And we will be back next week with Paper Airplanes. Very excited for that interview. And I will be closing out your week in style on Friday. Thank you, guys. Take care.